Good morning everybody. Welcome to this morning's worship. Praise the Lord. Come, praise the Lord. Everything in heaven and earth, praise God. Praise the Lord, all creation, sun, moon and shining stars. Everything in heaven and earth, praise God. Praise the Lord, sea and land, animals, birds and all nature. Everything in heaven and earth, praise God. Rulers and nations, young and old together, everything, everywhere, praise the Lord. Let us pray. God of kindness and compassion, God of fairness and justice, God who sees all and hears all, we worship you. God of infinite love and boundless hope, who calls us to life with you, now and always, we worship and adore you. Amen. Good morning, church. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the need of prayer. Lord, we're giving thanks for all the blessings that you bestow on us, Lord. We are thankful, Lord, that you are so mindful of us, Lord, that you know our every need before we even think it, Lord, or say it. I pray, Lord, for our families and our friends, Lord, who are either going through trials or tribulations or just the hardship of day-to-day -day life. I pray for those who are waiting on tests, Lord, that the test results will come back, Lord, clear and in, in good favour for them, Lord. I pray for those who are looking for jobs, Lord, help them to find jobs, or those looking for homes. As we go out through our world, keep us safe, because in these times we're living, Lord, we don't always, we're not always mindful of our fellow man, Lord. I pray that as we go out in the world, we will take your message and that we'll impart it to people we meet, even if it's just a kind word or a, a friendly smile. I pray for our church. Please help us to grow in faith, Lord, stronger in faith, and help us to listen to your message and gladly receive it in our hearts. I, pr I pray, Lord, because each of us are on our faith journey at different pace, places, would you know where we are and what we need? I pray, Lord, that we'll get the resources to strengthen our faith and to give us hope. Hope in the time, Lord, that right now our world seems at times so dark from the loss of um, our queen to the loss of family and friends to um, an unstable government for the war that's going on in Ukraine and the threats from the Russian government. Help us not to give in to fear and anxiety but to trust in you, that know that you have all this in, in mind and you know all that we need. Grant us your peace, that perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. I pray that you will guard our hearts and minds. In Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. The first reading is from Luke chapter 16 verses 19 to 31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores, and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away, with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham. Have pity on me, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot nor can I anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. 
He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. The second reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 6 verses 6 to 19. But godliness with contentment is a great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into the temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, free, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, will test who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. What can you do with money, apart from the money you need to get by on and live out your lives with? What if you had that amount of money that you've always dreamed of having, what would you do with it? How could you use it? Well, you could do any of the usual things you do with money, if you've got it. You could invest it and reap a good percentage more, hopefully. You could spend, spend, spend it on goods and life experiences for yourself. Buy the things you've always wanted. Or you could simply save it for a rainy day. Or if you didn't quite have enough for what you really, really wanted, you could borrow some more. You could put your wealth to work to gain power. Influence others in making decisions in your favour to your advantage and win friends for yourself. There again, you could use your money to help others in need. When you have a small amount of money, it often appears clear to you what the best use of your money could be. Even if we don't have much money, but enter competitions to win cash prizes or play the lottery in the hope of gaining the millions, then we still have good intentions to put any winnings to good use to ease the burdens of the hungry and destitute in some way. The trouble comes when we are actually in receipt of the money. Then the fear of losing it sets in and the worry of the begging letters and the necessity of taking care of all this fortune overwhelms us. We may well think to ourselves, an opportunity like this doesn't come our way every day and we may get taken over by the huge responsibility of having the money and of deciding what to do with it. So what we first thought we would use it for goes out of the window, usually followed by the compilations of a shopping list of all the things a person would like to have for themselves if they had the money to buy them. Almost every day there are new stories and pictures on the telly and requests for prayers for individuals and groups of people, in fact sometimes whole communities who need help. That help could be brought about by using the resources we already have, 
whether it be our prayers, our time, our friendship and support, or our financial help. Very often we hear about these people's needs and we feel helpless to act. Either we don't know what we could do to make the difference, that the people seem so distant from our corner of the world, or we fear to get involved because to act could possibly put us, put us in danger. Hopefully, we wouldn't change channels on the telly, but we might soon forget about acting on our instincts to help out, even if we do remember to include these peoples in our prayer. We need to examine ourselves regularly to see where we could be doing better. In our prayer life, there may be people we could include in our prayers who are a little beyond our comfort zone to include. There may be appeals we could support, even in a small way, or people we could help practically. However, in order to feel better able to meet the task in front of us, we would do well to come before God in prayer and seek his forgiveness for what we have failed to do and ask him to help us to do better. When we confess our sins to God, we will find that we are set free from the guilt we carry around and we receive freedom to start afresh and tackle what we have failed to address in the past. There is a prayer which I learned at an Anglican church I went to as a ministerial student, which helps us see the problem we face in our lives from time to time. It goes, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our fellow men and women in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. The kind of sin we often try to address is this sin of omission, what we have failed to do and should have done rather than something we've actually done wrong. We need to realise that when we do not do things, the things that we may have put off until tomorrow, which never comes, or the things we turn a blind eye to repeatedly can cause hurt and suffering to God and to others. The rich man's sins which you read about in the story told by Jesus are sins of negligence, sins of omission. There was Lazarus, ill and helpless, suffering from hunger and in pain. Other people had to actually bring him to the rich man's door. He had no food, probably not much shelter, and would be poorly dressed. He had no job other than to beg for whatever people could spare for him. He was malnourished and had sores on his body. We hear that the rich man's dogs licked his sores and his open wounds. The rich man ignored his presence and his need. It doesn't sound as though he even gets given the scraps that fell from the rich man's table, because the dogs had those. The rich man had the money and the power to act differently and to help this man, but he didn't. At the very least, he could have given him some of his leftovers from the table instead of giving it all to his dogs. He could have offered him shelter, maybe a, a job as a servant after he'd been nourished a bit more, of course, but, but no. The rich man kept everything for himself and refused to acknowledge the presence of Lazarus, let alone see his great need. Lazarus died and we hear that the angels carried him to a seat beside Abraham at the feast in heaven. The rich man died and was buried and we learn he went to Hades. But hold on a minute, Abraham had been blessed with riches by God during his life. One rich man, Abraham, had gone to heaven whilst the other rich man didn't. The difference if we look at the lives they lived is that Abraham was generous and shared his riches with others. Whereas, as the poor beggar found out, the other rich man was selfish and refused to share his good fortune with those in need. Abraham loved God before everything else he possessed in life. He was generous to others who were in need and he gave back a portion of his riches to God. It was not being rich in itself that made the difference, but how the person handled the wealth that they had. What it came down to in the end is whether one's wealth is allowed to take hold of the person or whether the person takes control of their wealth 
and does not let it take over their life. We hear Paul telling Timothy in his letter to this young Christian leader that it is the love of money that is the root of all evil, not money itself. Even as the rich man calls out to ask Abraham to send Lazarus to quench his thirst with a finger dipped in water, he continues to see other people as being there to serve his need. He does not think this situation is fair, his situation. No one told him that this would happen. No one warned him that more was expected of him during his lifetime. So the rich man asked Lazarus be sent to forewarn his five brothers so that they do not end up in this situation themselves. Well, the answer comes back that people living their lives on earth have all the warnings and the information that they need. The rich man's relatives had the scriptures to show them how they should live. The prophet Isaiah is clear on this as he expresses God's word to the people. He says, the kind of fasting I want is this, remove the chains of oppression and the yoke of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Share your food with the hungry and open your homes to the homeless poor. Give clothes to those who have nothing to wear and do not refuse to help your own relatives. As Christians, the Lord's word is clearly expressed to us too. Love one's neighbour, clothe the naked, feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty and remember those in prison. The Lord continually points to the right thing to do and passes on his message of love and generosity and compassion, hoping that hard hearts will soften and turn back to him, as well as look out for the well-being of the people around us in this world. Having wealth should not turn us away from God, but help us meet the needs of those without the basics in life, and those with little opportunity to make a living. Being blessed in our lives with riches should encourage us to give willingly and enthusiastically, then we will find ourselves in the presence of our Lord, who cares about each one of us. We may not be able to respond to all the people we come across with great needs, but we must surely be able to help a few people. In our handling of all that we are blessed with, may we put it to good use to help brothers and sisters in need. But as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7, God loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Lord, we know that your kingdom exists wherever injustice is challenged, wherever the oppressed are set free, wherever the hungry are fed, wherever the helpless helped and foreigners welcomed. Help us to work for this wherever we are this week. Amen.
Let's say the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Uh